Hello, 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 everybody. I hope you all are doing well. Welcome back to the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. Let's pick up where we left off. Is it possible that this other top secret case is what what's alluded to in this newspaper article here? The classified secret being leaked overseas from the Ministry of Justice. How the bleeding door could you? We discovered during the course of this trial the music de box deposited at Winderbanks by Magnus McGilded. A special music box designed to play two discs at once. It would seem very likely now that the encoded, uh, that encoded on the pair of discs that were in the McGilded possession are the leaked classified secrets. So I put it to you, Inspector, that in order to recover the second of, of the disc containing those secrets, you covertly made a deal with McGrady in which you exchanged the disc for details of the case. You, you little ah! Order, order. On the day of the incident, when we met you at Windebanks, you said this. I'll be taking that whatever it is off McGilda down to the yard. Thank you very much. So I hand it over. Now don't, don't give it to him. It's mine, that is mine. I'm sorry, miss. But anything belonging to McGilden has to be taken in evidence now. Scotland Yard already knew at the time, isn't that right? That Magnus McGilden was involved in the stealing of the government's secrets. My orders were... Recover the medium used to convey the secret leaked... Uh, secrets leaked from the mist. And do it on the... QT Strictly Hush Hush. And that explains why, when I presented the disc as evidence to the court, you objected so heavily, I presumed. Because you knew that it contained highly confidential information. But I knew, not likely. I mean, I wasn't that sure of it myself. I realized there was a possibility, that's all. Inspector, surely, surely you're not saying that in order to acquire the second of these music box discs, you did indeed reveal confidential details of the crime scene to the witness. A the abbot, this day the abbot, this man is giving false testimony. There's no other way that Mr. Graydon could have known of the existence of the people. It's the only explanation. A deal was struck between the two men. Man, I kind of want some wedges, some fries that he's Objection. having right now. Oh, how he would call it his chips. If, uh, if, and I stress, if this sobering assertion turns out to be fond, founded in truth. It would mean that the second disc is as we speak here in this very courtroom. Wait, what? In this courtroom? How could you possibly make that claim like that? Because Inspector Gregson is a Scotland Yard detective. What? But what's that supposed to mean, eh? As a seasoned policeman, the inspector will have approached his alleged deal with caution. Certainly, he would not have accepted a gentleman's agreement in this matter. No, he would have insisted on having the article agreed upon in the palm of his hand. Good gracious, then. You mean to say... Inspector Gregson already has the item in question in his possession. He has a second disc actually on his yes. person. The defendant defense demands that the inspector is searched at once. Definitely. They could have only have struck a deal with each other when Guinea was testifying before. And Gregson hasn't moved from the witness stand since. My, my lord, please order examination of his personal effects immediately. Well, Inspector. This young lad wants to tone down his imagination. He insulted me in my profession quite enough. However, if you'll put this matter to bed and dispel any doubts about my involvement, then I'll happily submit to a body search. What? He's going to agree to it. I presume you are aware of the precipice on which you now teeter, my learned student friend. You've made a most serious alleg allegation against Scotland Yard here. If following the search of the inspector's personal effects, no disc is found, you will be deemed unfit for Kurt's service. This trial will end, and my country's government will formally demand of yours that you are severely reprimanded. That sounds serious. Indeed. 
to have a visiting soon and make a deflammatory remarks about our country's most senior police officer is not something Her Majesty's government will be able to overlook. Threatening just- you're just threatening Ruder because you're scared. The accused is beyond serious. You must be prepared for grave consequences. It's true. Can't imagine Gregson would have accepted a gentleman's agreement for something so critical. The disc must have physically changed hands, which means the inspector should have it. But somehow, something doesn't feel quite right here. Very well, Council, you know the implications, so let me ask you one final time. Y yes, my lord. Do you still persist? Do you still persist in formally requesting a search of the inspector's personal effects? Oh, I mean, the fact that he agreed to it so easily, something tells me differently. I did see there were three options, so... Might be something around this. Hmm... What if... Oh, what if it's not on him? What if we said search someone else? Yes, the defense formally demands the search be conducted. Oh. Don't say you weren't warned, but your typical Nibini stubbornness may well land you in hot waters this time. Perhaps the lesson will do you some good. Fair enough, I got nothing to hide. Did I choose the wrong option? Very well then. Bailiff, conduct the search of the inspect- <laughs> What a weak slap. The defense demands a search, but not of the inspector Gregson. What? Now what's all this? I'm the one you're accusing, aren't I? I thought you would wanted to search me. No, no, inspector, not you. Somebody else. What's the meaning of this, eh? Lost it all? Have you, sunshine? The court shouldn't have to put up with this nonsense. You're being completely irrational. Be quiet, all of you. Who said that? Oh, it was Garrus. We're just doing what all, all of, doing what you all told him to do. Having the courage of his conviction. You should respect that and listen to what he has to say in good faith. Because that's the British way. <laughs> no one objects to that. Well said, young lady. Indeed, this court is in awe of the defense's council conviction and eagerly awaits his next words. You what? Now don't be hasty, my lord. If I'm not mistaken about things I've seen in court today, I'm fairly sure I know who has that disc at the moment. There's only one person it can be. Council, of whom do you request a search of now? Oh, okay, well... If he doesn't have the disc on him... Yet. He wanted the disc. That means the only person who could give him the disc is the other person who he made the dealings with. Oh, hopefully I'm not wrong. Oops. Take that! Mr. Ashley Grader and my lord. The defense demands that he be searched at once. Very well, I presume you will not protest, Mr. Graydon. Au contraire. Did I do it right? Uh, and so a brief body search was carried out by this court bailiff. A few short minutes later, it was revealed that Mr. Graydon had nothing unusual on his person at all. Darn it! <laughs> what, is it on the brothers? Wait, who could it be on? I, I, I'm mad. I lost here. Ah, yep. Definitely was wrong there. Alright, I might as well just load back in. Darn it. Alright. Right, the obvious answer was him. But it wasn't him. Ah, uh, let me think. Let me think now. Who do we request to search of? Uh, what? Is it his brothers? <laughs> Oh, I know, I know. I th well, I think I know. I think it's him. Because it was a moment where the detective is suddenly shaking him down. Okay, let's do it. Let's Take message that. it to him. I completely forgot he got shook down. Of my lord, Mr. Naskulkin. Well, I never. Eh? Me? Him? 
Very well, Bailiff. Restrain the witness and conduct the thorough search of his personal right. effects. Please, my lord. Inspector? Scotland Yard, um, has to object to this Objection. search. Unfortunately for you, Inspector, your objections carry no weight here. In this courtroom, only the prosecution and defense have the authority to object. But, but Lord Van Zeeks, I have no interest what forces are in play that might influence your actions. But personally, I have no intentions of obstructing the course of this trial. Uh, may live, carry out the search. No, no, hold, hold on a moment. I, I don't know nothing. Nothing about no disc. Cut it out. <laughs> ah. Here, my lord, in the witness in the witness pockets, I found this. Good lord, that's another music box disc. I know nothing about it, nothing. All right, that explains why he shook him down. I completely forgot about that. I was thinking of, like, who had interactions with him. That is the second music box disc left behind by Magnus McGillney. Is it not, Inspector Gregson? Ah! He's losing his chips. Order, order, Mrs. Gorkin, what have you to say for this? Gordon Bennett, I mean, just Gordon Flamin Bennett. I swear I didn't know nothing about that disc. Honest to God. Also, would you please explain what exactly is going on here? The alleged deal that was struck was between this witness and this detective. No. Without a question, my lord. Then for pity's sake, why on earth was this man in possession of the disc that Inspector traded for information? Inspector Gregson is a shrewd, calculating man who rarely loses his composure. But at one particular point in his trial, he exhibited some unusual behavior for a brief moment. I don't recall. What situation? What unusual behavior? It was, yes, during my cross examination, Mr. Graydon. Tell me, Mr. Graydon, when you left the pawnbrokers that night, was it by any chance the second disc in your jacket pocket? I admit nothing of the sort. While Mr. Graydon was answering my question, the inspector appeared to have grabbed Nash Skulkin by his coat and was shaking him violently. Yeah, you did, and all that me noggin was gone off the clean, I did. I was wishing I'd been born as me brother I was. And what exactly happened to make the detective attack you like that? I ain't got a clue, he just suddenly turned and grabbed me and whistled like that and started shaking. Why the blaze didn't mention the third gun when he got down to the station, was he said. Got it right in my ears, he did. Me ears yeah, still throbbing now. The way the detective behaved then was extremely out of character. But looking back at it, I must have been that he did it. That was the opportunity Inspector Gregson created for himself in order to hide the disc. Well, bless my wig, he hit it. You. I'm afraid I failed to comprehend the motive here. If the detective had acquired the disc he was after, why on earth would he then proceed to hide it in another man's pocket? This is a court of law. He could have submitted the item as evidence. It would appear, my lord, my lord, that the inspector was not at all at liberty to do that. Why ever not? As, as the man himself revealed earlier, his current assignment has some special conditions. My orders were, recover the medium used to convey the secret leaked from the ministry, and to do it on the QT strictly hush hush. Hush? A top secret assignment, is it? As far as we're aware, the information stolen comes from confidential government communications. It would seem that if the information were to be revealed in court as evidence, it would be problematic. Does that sum up the situation, Inspector? I'm operating under I'm operating under direct orders from the ministry. I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to answer that question. 
So, realizing there was a chance that you may be searched here in the court, you took steps to hide the disc you had acquired from the witness. Uh, does this mean? You only pretended to attack Mr. Skulking in order to get close enough to him. Slip the second disc into his pocket. What was the pretense? Oh man, come on, can we just skip over this part? <laughs> I feel like this is just taking longer than it should have. Well, now, Inspector Gregson, you now, and you, Mr. Graydon, are you prepared to admit the accusations made against you of this alleged deal? Admit to it, yours truly, please. Mr. Graydon, clearly our Eastern visitor has an uncommonly active imagination. However, there's no proof that I passed the disc to the inspector. But, but then, how do you explain the reason why you knew about the disc and the people? I'm under no obligation to explain. What? Yes, I lied in my testimony. That I admit. So sentence me accordingly. But that is all I admit. Murder? Leaking government information? Striking a deal with the detective? All of this young eastern man's fancy. I have no idea what any of this is about. You, you what? Ah, oh, I'm trying to pull a fast one on us. Well, what about you then, Inspector Gregson? Do you admit making a deal with Graydon in order to acquire the disc? Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, as a Scotland Yard inspector, I will declare this and nothing more. I am acting in the best interest of the country. Whatever I've done is the name of the justice. So, as a member of the public of this fine country, I'd like to think that justice will be guiding light when you're making your decisions. This is quite a quandary indeed. Rarely have I encountered such extraordinary tumultuousness in the conclusions of a trial. Nevertheless, in the absence of further evidence to, this, uh, to be presented, I believe it is time that we put the matter of the jury for the final leanings. Well, now, as a fellow shepherd of queen and country, I must, I must sympathize with the old inspector. Yes, he's a dependable man. I'm quite sure in service of one becomes a good judge of character. Even crossing the eyes doesn't help when it comes to looking at this case. It's all blurred to me. Well, as a fellow professional, I'd like to put my faith in the detective, really? Kane and Heidi's skilled operator stuff. Currently in prison's vital stuff. The detective has very much trust in eyes. More than this, I cannot say. I don't believe it. These six jurors are they're going to believe Gregson if they declare the decision now. Is Kenny going to be found guilty? I don't manage to produce some definitive evidence right now, then we're going to lose. Either some proof that Graydon killed Mr. Winterbanks or stole those government secrets. Or some evidence to force Gregson into admitting that he struck a deal with the witness. Oh, what do I present? Well then, counsel, I think it's time to oppose on the jurors to declare their final decisions, no? That is, unless you have some compelling evidence you have thus far not presented to the court. If I let the judge call on the jurors who announced their leanings, Gina will be found guilty. So there's no choice then, Bruno. You have to throw some evidence at them. This is it now. All comes down to this. Who do I present evidence against? Mr. Gregson or Graydon? Oh, this is hard. <laughs> they really... They really made it difficult in this last part. I don't, it's because it's not completely obvious to me at all. Alright, let me look at my evidence. My court records. What do I have here that can help me? I mean, the other thing hasn't been presented to the court. Who would I present? Graydon or Inspect uh, Inspector Gregson? Oh, this is hard. Uh, blood samples, Iris' story, anything of that that's going to give me any hints. Notes collect collected. Anything here of interest? Uh, Magnum the good, persecution, blah, blah, blah. Conviction was assured with, with three eyewitness testimonies. However, the spice world witness resulted in the acquittal. 
Fucking... Let's see, this morning's newspaper, palm broker, blah, blah, blah. Can I present this in any way? As uh, so from page, Ministry Mall, classified, a tenure, blah, blah, blah. About secret communication between Britain and the Great Allies. Apparently, they're being intercepted by hostile nations. Communications are being intercepted by how with somebody between that. Question isn't. I've come up with three different possibilities so far. No, nothing. Darn, I'm really at a loss here. Uh, hmm. I'm gonna go with my gut. Let's say Inspector Grix. Inspector Gregson, there is one final piece of evidence I would like you to see. Uh, what's what that then? If you refuse to acknowledge that you did in fact strike a deal with the witness here today, then you leave us no choice but to examine this piece of evidence thoroughly. Well, go on. This is my last chance. It looks like I'm going to have to force his hand here. One final piece of evidence to go to get this detective to admit the deal he clearly struck with Grayson. Don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. I don't want to save here. I saved on the previous part. Uh, what could be the evidence though? What's this? I'll talk to you before. Uh, time of death. Single bullet. Let them know the trauma. A bullet room. Rising diagonal. That's not going to help us in any way. Got a photograph. Got the guns. A stereoscope that I don't believe this will help us in any way. Uh, can this pop up just so I can look inside of it? No. We got the strange music box disc. I opened this already to show the other side. I mean, if we do have the disc, can we please put it in? <laughs> I don't think we have the other disc, but let me see. Ah, uh, no, it doesn't seem like we're going to be able to do that. Oh man, I am completely out of lost here. Really, I am. Uh, let me see. One piece of evidence to get detective to admit the dealing clearly struck Mr. Graydon. Uh, I kind of want to do this one just for fun, but I don't think that's going to work. I don't know. What happens if I present this? Try. Is that Mr. McGill's music box disc council? Yes, the first disc of two, which has already been placed in Mr. McGill's special music box ready to play. I think perhaps now would be a good time to listen to the sound produced by the music box again. Oh, I, the music stops, so that always means I got it right. I'm surprised I got it right. Only this time... With the second disc we've just discovered set in place as well. Goodness, the disc, Council! No, wait, I, I can't I can't let you do that. Why not? But, but because, because, um, well, because it's got nothing to do with this case. That's why. Objection. Not true, Inspector. <laughs> The defense has already proposed that the sound heard by the court earlier from this music box were part of a Morse code message. We know that Morse code compromises of two distinct tones. The defense believes that the second disc contains the second tone needed to complete the message. And now we have a chance to confirm that theory. For crying out loud, sunshine, we're talking about the state of secrets here. If, we, if you are letting the whole courtroom hear confidential information like that, it's, it's treason. Then do you admit the charge? In order to protect this, those state secrets, you engage in all lawful dealing with the witness. You're, you're mad. If you let that secret information out in the public domain, you'll, you'll be making an enemy of the entire British Empire okay. government. You idiot. <laughs> Let's not forget, Inspector, that you, a Scotland Yard officer, leaked confidential case details to a witness. That you continue to lie to the court in all because, by fair means of foil, you determined to do your duty. Well, by fair means of foil, I'm prepared to do mine. Don't you dare. I will stop at nothing to protect my client. I don't care who I make an enemy of. My lord, if you please, 
The court must hear the sound made by that music box. Come on, Ramsey, for Pete's sake, stop them. Objection. Inspector, you should know of my methods by now. I'm a prosecutor. I'm not Scotland Yard. In this courtroom, my duty is to the law. So let me propose a toast to uncovering the truth by fair means of foil. Oh, foul. I've been saying foil this whole time. <laughs> very well, the defense stands here and that of the prosecution has been made very clear, I feel. Therefore, in accordance with the defense request, the court will now listen as the music box is sent in operation once more. This time with the second desk in place and both desks playing simultaneously. Ooh, let's go hear what's gonna happen. Oh yeah, that's clearly most code. Oh, listen to that. It's, it's unmistakable now. It's most code. All right, all right, I admit it. Whatever you want. But for the love of God, shut that blooming box up. And there you have it. Are we finally going to end the case here? <laughs> Let me ask you again then, Inspector Gregson. Did you or did you not strike a deal with the witness next to you in the stand, Mr. Ashley Grid? Specifically, did you furnish the witness with confidential case details in exchange for this music box disc? Did you reveal the existence of the people in the pawnbroker's storeroom door, Inspector? I did. Stop. What are you doing, man? It's all exactly like the young Eastern lawyer said. When the trial resumed after the recess, and we were stood there in the stand together, that's when he approached me with a deal. Shut up, you imbecile. Shut up. It's you there. You're the detective who turned up at the pawnbroker the other day, aren't you? I may have something you're looking for, Inspector, with me at this very moment. So how about a trade? I suggest you accept. Or information that may make certain individuals uncomfortable will soon become very public indeed. I couldn't let that information become public knowledge. Not under any circumstance. So I accepted the man's proposal and told him details about the case that should have put him in the clear. The people in the storeroom door and the bloodstains on the overcoats. By giving false testimony, the witness indeed to have the defendant wrongly accused of murder. Inspector, you knew that. Yet you still revealed those details to facilitate, facilitate, facilitate the witness's perjury. I did. But then it turned out the people had only been made that night after the incident took place. Scotland Yard wasn't aware of that, if I'm perfectly honest. Well, Mr. Graydon, what do you have to say for yourself? Uh, I... There's nothing and no one left for you to hide behind. You struck a deal with the inspector in order to escape conviction of a very serious crime. Namely this. You are the third intruder who broke into the pawn broker on the night in question. And you perpetrated the murder of the proprietor, Mr. Pop Windebanks. You. You. Protesting. Traitor! Oh gosh, he's becoming violent. Oh my gosh, what a turn of events. Bailiff, bailiff, restrict that man at once. That's it then. It's all over. I despise my life growing up. Those slums are vile. Oh, I think it's the guy talking. I despise my life growing up. Those slums are vile places. I was cursed from birth, born into poverty, the son of a penniless artisan. 
My parents did nothing but quarrel all day long. What little money they had was never spent on me. So I set about studying to better myself. One day I escaped from that hellhole. And you eventually became a communications officer. I admire your determination. But then you decided to try to sell government secrets. Why? Isn't that obvious? Because I wanted money. Even now, years later, the nightmares of my life in the slums wake me in the small hours. I wanted to drown them with more money than anyone could live in that squalor could ever imagine. Then one day I met him. Mr. Magnus McGilded. You're feeling a... You've been with a queer talent, so you are. I have money to throw your way if you're interested. All you need to do is go along with me little plan now. I was trying to I was trying to steal ministry telegraphic messages logs and McGilded would bear it, buy them for a handsome sum. As I was responsible for inspections of the ministry communication office, it was simply enough task. The lure of the devil's offering, how easy is it to succumb? But you must surely have realized the seriousness of the crimes you were committing. And for that reason, I took great lengths to ensure that my actions were untraceable. By, by using the music box. My father was a brickmaker, though my mother divorced him when I was still a child. Yes, Mr. Mason Milverton. That's right, and he was very skilled with his hands. He'd once been a music box maker apprentice. I imagine his skills would be sufficient to create a machine that would go, that could generate Morse code. So I've sought out my father again to employ his service. It was the first time I'd seen him since I left the sums 10 years ago. Look at you, Ashley. What a fine gent you've become, eh? He was a different man to the one in memory. A thin, frail old man. Poverty had never broken him. Never corrupted him like it had me. I was sure that he wouldn't help me if I told him the real reason, so I made up a story. I've got some, I've got some work for you, father. I need some music box discs made. Music box sticks, eh? A musician friend of mine has written some music he wants to sell to the public. I brought the score with me. There are two, actually. I'll be delighted, son. It's been 20 years since I did any work like this, though. Fetch my tools, would you? In the loft. That's how I had him make the two discs. Thereby splitting the information in two, you were taking considerable precautions indeed. I wa it was to protect myself as much as anything. It meant that I could deal with McGill did in two separate transactions. The first involved the first of the two discs and the music box for playing them. I exchanged them with McGill did for 10 guineas. Then on receipt of the second disc, he would pay a thousand guineas. So what happened on the omnibus two months ago? was the second part of the deal, the exchange of the second desk. Yes. I would sold the man's information the way a number of times already, but it seems he became reluctant to the part of it with his money. But that doesn't quite make sense, Mr. Grady, for why was it that on the omnibus two months ago, your father, Mr. Milverton, was the one dealing with McGilda and not yourself? When I received the thousand guineas after my first completed dealings with McGilded, I decided to give 200 to my father for his troubles. But my father realized something was amiss. In time, he worked out that I must be involved in something dubious. And when he did, he said to me, Next time there's an exchange, you'll let your old man do it, understand? Otherwise, I won't take your money anymore. That was my father's way of dealing with it, I suppose. Climb into the omnibus, hand over the second disc, 
and take the money from Mikilde, that is. He had no idea what was actually on the disc. And I asked him to make, he never know. Just like I'll never know why everything went so horribly wrong that night. All I know is that disc was taken from him, and I never and he never returned home. It was only then that I found what sort of monster McGilda really was. So after ten years of not once uttering it, I swore on my father's name. To exact revenge. Revenge? As anyone with even the remotest knowledge of the man who will no doubt be able to imagine, McGilded brought all his wealth and influence to bear in the most despicable of ways. To crush any semblance of justice in this trial. The crime scene was tampered with evidence, was evidence was fixed, and the witnesses were bribed. The trial two months ago was a farce from the start to finish. My feet had barely touched the British soil back then, and I walked into that hornet's nest completely unaware of the sinister background to it all. I made plenty of money out of my dealing with McGilder by then, so I spared nothing in my arrangement two months ago. I knew exactly who to hire. If you're willing to pay the price, there are people in this city willing to do anything you ask. McGilder himself had shown me that. Uh, are you saying that? I think you have that picture now. After he twisted everything into his favor in this courtroom to ensure that he walked free. I took matters into my own hands and delivered the justice that monster deserves. Ooh, everything unraveling. That tragic accident following the trial two months ago was planned and executed by yours truly. But Gilded's death that day was caused by this man. He dressed up as a bailiff, isn't it? Everything is ready, sir. If you'd like to follow me into the courtroom. What's this, officer? Tis sooner than I thought led to believe. I hope it's not an inconvenience, sir. There were some changes to the schedule. Well, I must be making tracks now. It's time for the inspection. They're going to examine the omnibus again, and so I'm told. And I'm asked, I asked if I could be present for it myself. So that policeman who came to tell McGill that he could examine the omnibus again. That's right. An imposter hired by me. McGill did use his wealth to manipulate the trial. He paid people to adulterate the omnibus with matters of false evidence. He threatened witnesses to lie in their testimony. So I gave the man a taste of his own mess. And once the omnibus was dozed, in a paraffin, one of my sham policemen ushered McGilda inside and sent him on a one-way journey to hell. Did he get a new stick? <laughs> an eye for an eye. That's how I avenged my father's death. A spine chilling account indeed. But that wasn't the end of it for me. There's a loose end, you see? A loose end. Yes, I should think it's obvious. The second disc which my father had taken to exchange with McGill. Ah, yes. It was intended no mention of it in the man's trial two months ago. Really because it had been removed from the scene of the crime. When I realized it was missing, I remembered something. Something from the first time I've dealt with McGill did. This is the first of the two discs in the music box you need to play. Well, look at you now. What an ingenious little invention. So then, as promised, a ten guineas for you, young man. What, what's this? When the bank's pawn brokery? It is a pawn brokery ticket, so it is. You can use it to redeem an article I've deposited in there. There's no need to give it a name. Just hand over the ticket and tell Bean the watchword. I put a jewel in your pawn for you. It'll fetch a good ten guineas if you set it so it will. I've never heard of a pawnbroker being used in quite such a way before. Have you not, Mr. Graydon? Those pawnbrokers are very useful places, you know. Each one is like an extremely secure vault. And then they proceed to talk some more. 
but I knew that if he'd taken steps to hide the desk, it would be in that pawnbroker somewhere. And that on the night he killed my father, he must have entrusted the ticket to someone. Yes, to Gina. I remember now that when we first met you at the Winterbanks that afternoon two days ago, you had a description of Mr. Strahd written down. How did you know who you were looking for? From the trial, that pickpocket assessment was clearly peculiar. Anyone could see that. I realized immediately that she was another one of McGilda's pawns, that he must have threatened her somehow. I was fairly convinced it would be her who had the tickets, so I started to make some inquiries. I had a strong suspicion the girl would come out of the woodwork on the redemption deadline. And he was absolutely right. And yes, sure enough, she did. All I needed to do was wait until the girl went to the Winterbank to redeem the articles. But unfortunately, she redeemed only McGilda's overcoat and the one disc that had was in the pocket. All important music discs of box was the second disc inside was missing. Because it had already been forfeited two days ago earlier. But I was unaware of that fact. Had I not been, I could have avoided my nighttime ex excursion. Meanwhile, all our investigations into the stolen government secret was progressing. We pick up the fact that Miguel was involved. Inspector, you recovered fast. My orders were to recover the stolen information as quickly as possible. So we started gathering a fellow's possession and examining whatever we could lay our hands on. We had a full-scale investigation going on at the yard, but we had, a f had to keep it as quiet as we could. Then, when the inspector here took the disc from me in the pawn brokery that day, I became nervous. I was sure the music box and the second disc were still in the shop somewhere. So I knew that it was a race against time. I had to face those articles before the police did. So that's what prompted you to break into the place in the, that same night. With the help of your old friend, the Skulkin Brothers. What happened that night in the pawn brokery? can only describe as a nightmare. While Nash and Ringer were searching the counter, I located the music box I'd, stole, I'd, I'd sold to McGilden on the shelves of forfeited articles. And the second disc was inside. <clears throat> yes, I slipped it into my pocket when I, with a very deep sigh of relief. But then, something entirely unexpected happened. What are you doing in my shop? A gunshot rang out in the shop, and I felt a sharp pain in my left arm. The broker fired his gun, and the bullet pierced your limb. Yes, exactly, but unfortunately, I decided to bring my own gun with me that night, just in case. Before I knew what was happening, I'd fired back. The man had already turned to flee, I didn't intend to fire in his direction, much less kill him, but unfortunately for both of us, the bullet hit home. It struck him in the middle of his back and he fled through the storeroom door for refuge. Ah, uh, it's a sorry, sorry tale. It took place in the blink of an eye. I don't imagine Nash and Ringo even realized what had happened at first. I was terrified, so I fled. And that's when the whole story... And that's the whole story. That's everything that happened at Winterbanks on the wretched night. Oh, and we got the whole story. And everyone is just in silence. Earlier, you called McGilda a monster, a man who used his wealth and influence to distort the facts and escape justice for the crime of murder. What tragic irony. But what you have done is exactly the same. You've become the very monster you saw and despised so deeply in McGilda. Yes. I think I have.
Well, this has been a long and exhausting trial. However, it would seem that the last we have arrived at the truth. Inspector Gregson, what of Ashley Graydon? He's been restrained, my lord, and is being escorted to the yard. He'll be charged with murder of Windebanks and the stealing of government secrets. Very good. And you, Inspector, regrettably, you will have to face charges yourself. Yes, my lord, of course. It transpires that you were complicit in helping a criminal escape justice. That fact remains whether or not you were doing so in line of duty. The crime is a serious one, Inspector. An, ex an excusable one. Now to the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade. Uh, yeah. It's time for the final abdication. Is the jury ready, Mr. Foreman? Yes, sir. Garrett and Scott are standing by, sir. This is really... This re is really it now. The last push, the final call, the finishing whistle. My men are ready to deliver the verdict. Thank you, Mr. Foreman. Very well, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. You will now declare your final decisions to the court. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Not guilty. Oh, I can't believe we're finally coming to a close of this very long case. <laughs> That's the stuff. I'm off the hook. Finally, Runa, you managed to do it. Finally is the word I really wasn't sure if we'd come on top of for a while there. Susie was right. You're the best lawyer in the world. Miss Lestrade, I am not finished with you yet. What? What are you looking at me for like that? Before you start enjoying your freedom, there are certain other crimes to consider. Eh? Two months ago in my courtroom, no less, you gave false testimony, did you not? In relation to the trial today, not only did you unlawfully enter Windebank's pawn burglary, you also attempted to abs abscond with Mr. McGillan's property, it seems. Eh? I never did nothing of this sort. Of course not. It's not like you were gleefully wearing McGillan's coat in the cell yesterday or anything. Oh, well. And just when I was getting excited about getting throwing a party for Ganeen this evening. And turning our attention to the defense. Determining that when played together, the music box disc contained a message in Morse code was, well, it was certainly a most unexpected revelation, Council. Quite so, my lord. Prosecution was caught entirely off guard. In fact, I think we should applaud my learned friend's courage here today. I propose a toast. To demanding that the government secrets be disseminated before the entire courtroom. Ah. Very sorry about that. It was only the, it was the only way I can get Inspector Gregson to admit what he had done, so... If, if I may have something on top of that... Isn't that... Some about the sound produced by the music box before. I do wonder if that was really most code at all. But what are you trying to say, madam? Oh, well, it's just that I'm really rather fanatical when it comes to most code, you see? So much that the whole truth, the whole world seems to be covered in dots and dashes to me, in fact. Goodness, madam, what a healthy, unhealthy level of obsession one feels. But I must say that, in my opinion, the sounds produced by those two discs. Well, nothing more than that. I mean, a series of two different tones. What? What? Can can that really be serious? It wasn't Morse code after all. My lord, the defense would like to listen to music box again. Are you off your nuts? How many times do I have to tell you? This courtroom is not an appropriate forum to discuss the nature of the government's communications. We know McGill that conspired to trade national secrets with our enemy. Secrets acquired from Mr. Graydon. Now that the man has admitted to his crimes, we have no need to pursue the matter further. Uh, but it's really going to bother me. Mr. Strahd? Yeah, me lord? Well, that wish you have seen today here in this courtroom have been extremely disturbing. Falsified evidence, intimidation, perjury, a grim catalog of depravity. An appalling experience to befall for any child. 
Come on, it ain't nothing I don't see most days in the back slums. I beg your pardon? If you're a weak, you pay for it. That's just how life goes. Gina. But look, I reckon I've worked something out today. The world ain't fair, but if you want it to change... You gotta start at home. You gotta start how you are yourself. Well, that's a very laudable lesson, I would say. I would eagerly forward to the born again Miss Lestrade, never gracing my courtroom with the presence again. Now, with regards to the murder of Mr. Popper in the Banks, proprietor of the pawnbrokery business on Baker Street, I hereby declare the defendant, Miss Gina Lestrade, not guilty. Woo! Firework time. Give me the fireworks. Yeah, fireworks. Very dangerous inside this room because there are definitely people on the top floor. Oh, yeah, she's going to fire one officer herself. I thought that was a smoke grenade. <laughs> you know, that could also shoot fireworks. That is all. Court adjourned. Well, I know this episode is going long, but there's I, there's not much left, and this is the final chapter for this part. So we're going to keep going till the end for this. On a personal mo note, I must say you've surprised me, my Far Eastern friend. Ah, oh. Despite being a Nipponese, you saw through the pretense, through the malice that festered within the English man. And at the same time, saw through the grime to the surprising hearts of your English clients. You have a curious talent for judging character, especially considering our very different cultures. I don't think there's anything curious about it. Whether we're from the Empire of Great Britain or the Empire of Japan, we're all human beings. We're not so different on the inside. You know, I took this case for one very simple reason. To lock swords with you again here in this courtroom. You did? When I encountered you for the first time two months ago, it reminded me. Of toasting friendship and trust with another Nipponese, only to find myself betrayed. My trust betrayed. Through you, I hope to look into the eyes of the man I once knew and try to understand. You mentioned something similar earlier today, about total betrayal at the hands of the Japanese. What happened exactly? <laughs> well, you may ask, and one day when the time comes, you will learn the answer, whether you like it or not. Oh, I guess that's a story for another time. Alright then, I'll wait for that day, if I must. Coming, coming to be known as the Reaper of the Belly in my retirement from service five years ago, it gives me cause to wonder if our meeting has some deeper purpose. So, farewell, my learned Nipponese fellow, until we meet again. Seventeenth April, five twenty-four p.m. The old Bailey defendant's antechamber. It's done. It's over at last. Ooh. But Rose Iris disappeared too. Ah, congratulations, Gina. I knew it all along. I knew that you were innocent. Well, you did what you said, Mister Now Otto. You, believe, you believed in me right up to the end. You're as odd as your name. What's odd about it? I told you I had faith in you, didn't I? No one ever has before, see? Kept a promise, I mean, properly. That's awful. I figured something out today. All me life growing up in the slums, I've never trusted no one. But that's just because I've been scared of being stabbed in the back. I mean, the more you trust someone, the more it hurts when they let you down. Yes, I think I can understand that. After all, I had a taste of it 
in that trial two months ago. I chose to trust someone and paid for it. That betrayal left a bigger, big scar. You know though, Gina, I worked something out quite recently too. Trusting in someone else is really an ex exercise in learning to trust yourself. And when your gut tells you the right thing to do, and your trust is rewarded. There's no better feeling in the world. I think I have you to thank for reminding me of that valuable lesson. Oh well, if you say so. Don't make a fat all sense though. I'm trying to say that putting my faith in you, Gina, has been a real pleasure. For crying out loud, pack it in! But I suppose I sort of feel the same way. I mean, sometimes I trust someone else is, uh, you know, alright. Thanks. This is the way I see it, Ryunosuke. Defense lawyer is only as good as his faith in his clients. That comes down to how much faith he has in himself. After this experience, I'm starting to feel like I understand what you mean. Kazuma, am I living up to your expectations? Am I turning out to be a lawyer you believe I could be? Pardon the interruption. He's still dressed up. What the deuce does a man have to do to be noticed around here, my dear fellow? Ah, that, that voice. It's too late for the, that voice now, Mr. Naruto. I've been standing here patiently in the corner for the room for an eternity. Aha, yes. It was me all along, I would have said when you finally have noticed me. But you people with your incessant flapping. Ah, Mr. Mr. Sholmes. Aha, yes, it was me all along. You see? Why was he dressed up again? I, I'd assume you've been taken back to the hospital, to be honest. Indeed I was, but I managed to escape again. Oh. I happen to be aware of one or two foibles of the doctors who were uh, standing to me. I merely made knowledge of them known to the man, and he happily issued me with a leave of absence. How very above board. But enough of my adventures. That was a fine victory, Mr. Naruto. Your tireless efforts just rewarded I feel. Congratulations are in order. As a close friend, I tip my hat to you. Oh, um, thank you. Hm. Some great detective you are. Great at being cold as ice, maybe. Have I irked you in some way, Mr. Strahd? Well, you've been having a snooze in a, in a nice off bed. Some of us have been fighting for our lives. Oh, well, that bullet did cause me to lose a substantial amount of blood, it's true. So I have indeed been feeling somewhat cold. Not perhaps as cold as ice, but, well, I have a feel. Can you take your hands off my neck, please, Mr. Sholmes? And in some way, I suppose, congratulations are in order for you too, Mr. Strahd. What's that supposed to mean? Why are you so half hearted Well, naturally, it's in, it's in my intention to alarm you, but... An acquittal in the trial with that particular prosecutor is perhaps a little precarious. Well done, Mr. Sholmes. Not alarming in the slice. Oh, the Reaper, you mean? Is anyone who's found not guilty in the trial while well, worked up and wins winds up dead anyways? Is that right? The very point I was trying to make, and it's exemplified by the face of Mr. Wigilda, in fact. Ah, but of course, I pay no attention to such irrational drivel myself. Yeah, well, I don't. It don't bother me. Oh, really? Cause not. The way I see it, the Reaper's a bit like, uh, I'm upstairs. I'm upstairs? You mean like God? Yeah, I'm upstairs knows what's what, right? He knows what's up, what people are like on the inside. He won't have got nothing wrong end of the stick. There are some coves like that bog trotter what are rotten to the core. At the end of the day, I'm upstairs making sure they get what they deserve. I suppose that's one way of looking at it. Divine justice is one thing, though. The Reaper talking... Taking matters into his own hands and claiming lives is another. Well, I ain't like that McGilded all this world, so I ain't scared. I got principles, see? 
a trait in which you and which is to be admired, Mr. Strahd. Oi! Just give a rest, all right? As I was saying, congratulations are in order. The news of your acquittal was very welcome news to me indeed. Let me express my heartfelt congratulations, Gina. Well, um, um... There you are, Hurley! How long have you been here? Honestly, I went to the main entrance especially to meet you there. Ah, Iris, my dear, I do apologize. But I w but wait, until I tell you what happened, this pair made utter fools of themselves. What happened? As you know, I have a penchant of disguise. I was hiding in this room dressed as a baby. And these dolts didn't have my presence at all. <laughs> they had no idea. Can you imagine, Iris? Where do you credit it? Hmm, I'm not sure, really. I beg your pardon? I'm sorry, Hurley, but you just don't have that weighty presence you seem to think you have. In fact, you really ought to be careful about that. It's going to land you in trouble one day. I'll be careful. <laughs> anyway, it's such a shame. It was so, I was so hoping to throw a party for Guinea tonight, but you won't be able to come, will you? Don't look like I'm going to be going nowhere for a while. You're the judge, Bap Hatter. I got stuff to make amends for, apparently. All them offenses. What was it again? Breaking, entering, taking the Bogtrot stuff, what was in the log, blah blah blah. Yes, I think you will find that basically being a pickpocket is the main offense. <laughs> but diving ain't no offense. It's a job, isn't it? No, I don't think so. That is an offense. Still, it has got me thinking all this. Maybe I should start looking for another line of work. I mean, you didn't start off as a lawyer, did you, Odo? Well, no. But I was never a pickpocket. <laughs> Well, anyway, I reckon I could make a change. I'm gonna go do something for all them lot like me from the slums. Something that makes a difference for them. That's a wonderful idea, Guinea. I'm sure you can do it. <laughs> what is it, Guinea? Nothing. Miss Gina Lestrade. Prisoner carriage has arrived, madam. Come with me to the rear gate at once. Right. Well, looks like I'm off then. Yes. Goodbye, Gina. And good luck. Um, um, Odo. Yes. Why is she bringing that thing out? <laughs> oh, ah! <laughs> what, what was that for? I, um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say, so. Ah, indeed. Perhaps the situation calls for a phrase. Here, here too, missing from your vocabulary, Mr. Shot. Eh? On occasions such as this, I would recommend a simple thank you. Oh, oh. Uh, oh, yes. It's a good advice, Guinea. Right, I see, well... Uh, thanks, Soto. Thank you for everything what you've done, for believing in me. Not at all. In fact, that should be my line. Thank you, Gina. Well, there she goes. I wonder if I'll ever get to see her again. Well, well, quite the indomitable pig purse. Oh, I nearly forgot. I bought a paper outside. It's a special edition and this trial is over in front of a whole page. Pig pocket's innocent proof. That was so quick. Isn't it wonderful? You should really have shown it to Gina, Iris. She would have been thrilled. Oh no, how silly of me. Anyway, but... Would you like the good news or the bad news? Uh, not again. <laughs> well, what do you say, Runo? Hurley? As usual, I think I'd rather get the bad news out of the way first. Absolutely not. I have no intention of listening to anything but good news. 
And there you have it. How people answer that question says a lot about them, doesn't it? Let's not go there. Alright then, maybe let's start with the good news this time. The rain has finally stopped. I was... It was a record level rainfall, apparently. Well, that's good news indeed. We can journey back into greater comfort. Alright then, what's the bad news? The huge storm has left sea, the seas very choppy. The channel in particular is awful, so sailing out of Dover has been delayed by a day or more. Wait, Dover? That's right. If we head to the station immediately, we may still make it in time to wave Susie off. Yes. But, but, it won't be a train, surely. We wouldn't be that lucky. Who do you think I am, Mr. Naruto? Mr. Sholmes? I rushed to Victoria Station earlier and made arrangements for a special express. If we hurry now, we will be there in time for dinner. And I know of the fine restaurant that serves the most delicious baked soul. No, the great detective does it again. <laughs> Indeed he does. I appear to be aware of a number of rail transport director foibles. What? I merely made a knowledge of them known to the man and he happily laid on the locomotive elementary. Just an idea, but it might be wise to stop manipulating people that way. Gosh. What are you waiting for then? To London, Victoria! On the move! Oh, wave off Iris. Eighteenth April, five thirty-two AM, Port of Dover, Quayside. That took somewhat longer than I anticipated. Susie Bo must be about to leave now. Mr. Sato, where are you? She's just right there. Over there, look! It looks like she's reading something. Hold it! She just about to toss a book. Mr. Sato, wait, what are you doing? <laughs> Mr. Naruhudo, what are you doing here? We came as soon as we could, after the trial, I mean. We heard that sailing were delayed due to the bad weather, you see? Oh, I... I see. Then, then tell me, how did Gina's trial go? It went well. She's, she was acquitted. That's wonderful. Really wonderful news. The book you were about to throw into the sea. It was your Encyclopedia of British Law, wasn't it? Oh dear, I was hoping you hadn't seen that. I'm not worried about practicing law in any way now. So I was saying my final farewell. You were saying goodbye to law? You, Susato-san? Would it be correct in assuming? It's because of the peephole, Mr. Sato. I deliberately altered the scene of the crime, and then I tried to hide the fact. What I did is utterly unforgivable. That reminds me. How did you ever come to have this, Susie? The night, uh, on the evening of the in on the evening of the incident, Mr. Sholmes had invited Gina to dinner. If you remember. Oh yes, he had a wonderful time. Well, Gina gave us a little introductory lesson, didn't she? To the auto pickpocketing, I mean. Oh, that was so much fun! I stole Runo's armband. Yes, please don't f don't do that again, Iris. The band's very important to me. Well, if it's so important, you should pay more attention to it. You didn't even notice it for ages. On a whim, I thought it would be fun to see if I could take the cap of Flappomatic. I put it in my. Really? And then I rather forgot about it until I found myself in Winterbank shop with it later that night. That seems pretty heavy. I'm surprised you didn't notice it. And then... Mr. Sholmes! Mr. Sholmes! Meet me, Mr. Ahuda! Right! After Mr. Ahuda, after Mr. Ahuda had left the shop, I started to think that door started to play on my mind. The storeroom door, you mean? Yes. If Gina was anywhere in the shop, I realized it could only be behind that door. And at the moment, the little device that I had put up in my sleep sprang to mind. 
Well, I was worried about Gina. I simply had to know. So you used the cat flap matic to make the people in the door. That's captured in a photographic print of the shop. But what of her these red-headed recorders? Indeed, it was one of the first importance that... Points. Precisely when the people was made, that information would prove to be Naruto's greatest weapon. Though naturally, without proof, it would be it would have announced anointed to nothing. But when I looked through the hole in the door, the sight of that met my eyes behind the blood cold run blood run cold. Thoughts started to run through my mind. I remember the trial two months ago earlier. The trial of Magnus been killed. I thought about how he had manipulated the evidence and arranged false testimony to secure his freedom. It made the British justice system feel dark and sinister to me. And then a terrible thought occurred to me. What if... What if some wicked criminal was planning to do the same thing now? Because of the appearance of the crime scene, it looked exactly as though Gina had shot the Mr. Windebanks. Even though I was sure she would have never done such a thing. You were, wor you were worried that the culprit would try to frame her for her crimes. That's right. But then I realized... It would be very difficult for anyone to give false testimony in this case. What do you mean? Well, the crime appeared to have appeared behind the door of a locked room. Blah, blah, blah. Locked room. For someone to claim falsely to have witnessed it there would not have been a way to go beyond the door. For which, a peephole would have been the very thing. Only the people I made wasn't actually there until after the crime had been committed, of course. And the criminal would know that so it wouldn't make any difference the possibility of a rather ingenious trap was there was it not a trap is that why she did it so is that why you kept it a secret susie you never mentioned that you made a people to anyone not even once i know and i knew at the time i was doing wrong criminal offense even that's why i decided to confide in mr sholmes mr Naruto is completely al backed in a corner with no other possible means to escape. The truth about the people could save him. That was my plan. He really does think of everything. But, but then why didn't you just tell me everything before the trial began? My dear fellow, you're not thinking straight. If she had done that, it would be have rendered you complicit to the whole escape. You could have been disbarred if you had been seen to have not knowing tampered with the crime scene. So Mr. Sato decided to shoulder the burden of the responsibility alone. For your sake and Mr. Stride's sake. Mr. Sato? The truth is, when it happened, I did it because... I lost a little bit of my faith in the law. Oh. I was worried that right, the right person wouldn't be convicted of this crime. But the moment I allowed myself to think that... Is the moment I lost my right to call myself a judicial assistant. What you did is incomparable to what he did. Graydon is the one who lied to in the witness stand using that people as a way to implicate Gina. And besides, if the people consistent if the people inconsistency hadn't existed, I'm not at all sure that she would have been acquitted in the end. Mr. Sato, what you did saved Gina's life. Well, with your kind words, Mr. Naruto, you saved me too from my regrets. Well, we must be all thankful that Mr. Strahd's freedom has been assured. Yes, exactly. Although some sort of loose ends in the trial will continue to play on my mind, I'm sure. But the revelation that the music box disc contains secret messages, Mr. Naruto. What a triumph to work that out. And I'm full of admiration. Well, actually, the argument wasn't quite as compelling as I thought it was. Oh, it wasn't. There was a communications officer among the juror members, you see. A telegraph operator. And she said that the majority of the sounds on the disc were just meaningless tones. As one would expect, after all, we are talking about secret government communications. No doubt they were written in cipher to avoid being readily understood, should they have been intercepted. In cipher? I see. So then we could never have hoped to understand the message anyway. 
Nonsense, my dear fellow. It's quite a zero pipeline down there, I assure you. A. So, I so you. What? Well, that can't be a real word, can it? How funny. Wait, Iris, what did you just say? Oh, um, I just said a sogi. Does that word mean something to you? It means something. Sogi was the name of my best friend. What? But how? How do, how do you know the name, Iris? I wrote it down during the trial before when the message was playing on the music box. She described it on the fly. She really is a genius. I thought the message probably wouldn't be written out in a plain most code, so I tried various ways to interpret it. But whatever I tried, the words just didn't seem to make any sense. That is, in English at least. Oh. It suddenly occurred to me, you see. There's more than one Morse code, not just the English variety. Various countries around the world have altered and added a Morse code to use their own language. I don't believe it. Are you saying... That's right. I've only actually seen a chart of Japanese Morse code once before. I think it's based on the the Iroha pan pangram, isn't it? And you mean to say that the Japanese Morse code, the message says Asogi. Yes, I think so. Sorry, I don't remember all of these Japanese Morse code. Iris, would you let me see that? Mr. Sato, do you really know, know it? Do you know Japanese Morse code? Yes, I spent some time studying it. Because I'm quite sure Morse code would be ever more important in the international communications. Then might I recommend, my dear madam, that you focus your efforts on the English version. Be that as may, Iris, show me the message, please. Of course. Oops, accidentally pressed the button. But, but what can this possibly mean? Whatever is in that long sequence of supposedly meaningless dots and dashes, it's made the color drain from Sato's face. There's no doubt that this message is written in Jap Japanese Morse code. So the British Empire has been using Japanese for secret communications. I don't understand the reason why, but the message appears to be a list, a list of four people's names. Four names. The first is K. Asogi. Kazuma Asogi. Why? Why was his name on the disc? The second is A. Shin. Shin. I don't recognize that name. And the third is T. Hiragusan. Hirag Gregson? Ah, it would seem that Tobias Gregson is the third man on this list. And what is his name doing in the secret government communication as well? And the last name. What's the matter, Mr. Sato? It's, it's just so strange, so unexpected. Oh, what is it, Susie? Don't keep us in suspense. Last name is J. Wilson. What? Wilson? John H. Wilson? You mean Daddy? It says only J. Wilson, I'm afraid. I can't be so sure. And after four, four names, it reads, if I translate from Japanese, that is all four. That's the end of the message, or rather, the end of what you noted down, Iris. I just can't believe it. Who would ever have thought that those discs contain Japanese Morse code? Not to mention a strange list of some disturbingly familiar names. It would appear that this particular message is a common communication of some kind of great, some kind between Great Britain and the Empire of Japan. But Daddy could be in Japan then. Where Susie and Runa come from? Oh, well. Hmm. No. It's not very likely, is it? I mean, there are thousands of people with the surname Wilson, and there must be lots of J's among them. Professor John H. Wilson. Uh, professor John H. was a visiting professor of medicine at the Imperial Yumei University. But we can't tell Iris about that now. We just, we just can't. This is so strange. Somehow, in solving cases, solving the case of Mr. Winnebake's murders today, I feel like I've rolled back a boulder at uh, the mouth of a very dark cave. I do wonder if perhaps it's a dark cave that we shouldn't be go wandering inside. Huh. 
Oh dear, the ship is going to set sail soon. Yes, it is. It seems. It seems so. I'll sail that steamed ship, the first to port of Dunkirk in France. I'll change onto a large passenger vessel for Japan. You're really going to go going then, Susie? We wish you a safe passage, Mr. Sato. Thank you so much. I wish you all the very best. Mr. Sato! I had hoped to have you always at my side to guide me and support me. Mr. Nahuno, please. Come back soon. As far as I'm concerned, you really are the best judicial assistant in the world. I'm... I'm quite sure... I'll be back before you know it. Really, Susie? Oh, now don't forget, Iris. I made you a promise I have yet to fulfill. A promise? About your manuscripts. Ah. Oh, yes, the Hounds of the Baskervilles. Well, I'll be waiting for you then, Susie. A promise is a promise. Definitely, Iris. Mr. Nahudo? Yes. Do you remember the first time we met? Yes, of course. On the SS Bureau when I was dragged out from that wardrobe still half asleep. If I remember rightly, you threw me half across the room of the cabin with a Susato takedown. You know very well what I'm talking about after that. It's strange being thrown together as we were in that case. I somehow felt straight away that you were the perfect person to continue Kazuma-sama's great legacy. Mr. Sato. And my instincts were right. I really want to believe. No, I'm sure of that. I'll be back soon. Farewell until then. Somehow we seem to have come to the end of the adventures of Ryunosuke Naruhodo. Or the first volume, at least. Looking back now, it feels as though fate has led me on this journey. Fate led me to becoming a lawyer, to traveling halfway around the world, to meeting the great detective. I'm sure there'll be trials and tribulations ahead. Of course there will. But whatever happens, I know I'll be able to turn my fortunes around. After all, I have the greatest friends in the world on my side. Ah, yes, Mr. Naruhudo. Yes, Mr. Sholmes. I have some rather awkward news. The railway company has decided to sue over the special express train, apparently. Huh? It's caused such a commotion on the line earlier. All of the trains had to wait at the stations. But really, we would never have made it to Dover in time otherwise. Anyway, I explained everything. All uh, I explained everything and how it was all your fault. Oh, what? What? I explained what? I believe a formal complaint should be delivered to your office tomorrow. But not to worry, my dear fellow. According to Mr. Sato, you love defending Iris. You love defending yourself in court. Uh, it's alright. I'm perfectly happy to testify. He really didn't look like the sort of man who'd do something so outrageous. See? Um, Mr. Sholmes? Yes. A word if you don't mind. Why, certainly. Any word you like. Just bellow it out, my dear fellow. Oh, yes. I love Runo's words. I And I know just one he'll use here. Then, I really must say... Objection!
All right, everyone. I believe that is the end of this half of the Great Ace Attorney Chronicles. You are seeing the credits now, but this is only because this is the first half of the game. The second half, we will get to maybe a little bit after a break from this recording. So I hope you guys enjoy this. I'll just leave you here to enjoy the credits and all that. So thank you all so much for watching. Remember, remember to like, comment, share, subscribe. And until then, I will see you all later. Goodbye.